Well, I feel like we should give ourselves a bit of a hand today because we are closing out the Old Testament. We have gone through uh, every book in the Old Testament on our Route 66. We've been looking at one book of the Bible, and now we are in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. And for any of us who have set out to read through the Old Testament, you, you, you know that you usually drop off by about Leviticus as you're going through the different laws and stuff, but we made it all the way through Malachi, so give yourself a little pat on the back. And um, I want to say, as I, was, as I was studying this, I feel like I came up with about five messages instead of one, but um, so buckle your seatbelt. And... Um, we are in the book of Malachi, and I just want to give you a little background on Malachi, and then a little overview of the book of Malachi, and then some applications for your life from Malachi. The book of Malachi, it takes place about 100 years after the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon, and so they've returned to their homeland, they've rebuilt the temple, sacrifices have resumed, life is kind of starting to return to normal, so to speak. And yet the bad news is, although the people are all the way back in their homeland and, and they're close to the temple, their hearts are still far away from God, as if they were still in a distant land. And God raises up a guy named Malachi, and the name Malachi means my messenger, and God used Malachi to be his messenger to his people to call them to repentance, to remind them of his continued love for them. And to ask, to call them to turn from their sin and instead to trust in the Lord. And so that's kind of a little bit of the background of what's going on in Malachi. Um, the format of Malachi, God offers a lot of confronting questions to the people in Malachi's day and age. Not because God needed answers, uh, because God knows everything. Um, but the people needed to examine themselves in light of God's truth. They needed to stop and just ponder what God was putting in front of them. And so if you uh, would like to follow along with some notes, I, I included a bulletin insert, um, and I'm going to jump into that now. Now, the big picture of Malachi that Malachi gives us is that God reminds us that a polluted perspective of God leads to profane practices in life. That is what's taking place in the book of Malachi. Now, here's a lot of different ways the book of Malachi highlights how the people have a polluted perspective of who God is and what God is, is like. They've lost, they've lost God's uh, sight of God's love for them. I'm just going to read a bunch of scriptures to you. Don't, don't feel the need to turn there because I'm just going through them quickly. Uh, Malachi 1-2 says, I have always loved you, says the Lord, but you retort, really? How have you loved us? So they don't, they're not seeing that God cares for them deeply, that, that he loves them more than anyone else does. Uh, they have a small view of God. Malachi 1-5 God says, then you will say, truly the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. So they have a very small picture of who God is at the moment. They aren't seeing God as deserving the utmost honor and respect in their lives. Malachi 1.6, the, the Lord of heaven's army says to the priests, a son honors his father and a servant respects his master's. But if, if I'm your father and master, where are the honor and respect that I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. So they're not giving God his proper place of honor and respect in their lives. God declares in Malachi 1.4, For I am a great king, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and my name is to be feared among the nations. But they're not seeing God like that. They're not seeing God as a majestic and mighty, all-powerful king. They're doubting God's justice and character. Um, and Malachi 3.13, it sums it up pretty well. When the Lord says, you have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have I said against you? So in other words, the people of Malachi, they have said awful things about God. They're not seeing him clearly for who he is. And they're not seeing the fact that they're not seeing God for who he, clear, who he really is. 
who, me? What, what are you talking about, God? I, I, I'm not sure what you're addressing. And so God is addressing this polluted perspective that they have and the fact that they're blind to it. Now, the polluted perspective that they have of God is leading to profane practices in their life. Um, the book of Malachi uh, outlines a lot of these. In Malachi 1.7, the Lord says, You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. They're offering sacrifices that are blind and um, lame or crippled, the ones that they can't use anymore. They're using those to be the offering. It's, it's as if you stopped by on your way to church and robbed a local convenience store and then put that in the offering and thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm giving some money. That's what counts, right, God? And God is saying, no, that, that's, not, that's not pleasing to me. Um, they are they're disregarding God's instructions that he's given to them. You know, all, all that we've been through so far on this Route 66 journey, all of God's revealed stru- instructions up to this point in the Old Testament, they're ignoring that. They're not following that. Malachi 1.13 says, um, the Lord says, you say it's too hard to serve the Lord and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. They're making false promises and they're lying. Uh, Malachi 2.11 says, the men of Judah have defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. They're divorcing their wives that they married when they're young just to find uh, new and younger women. Um, and the Lord says, you are overwhelming your wives with cruelty and being unfaithful. I hate this. And especially in that day and age when it was really, really difficult for a woman to have a job where they can make any sort of money, they were just sending their wives to the wolves, basically, and finding an upgrade, and the Lord was very upset about that. They're being greedy and selfish and not putting God first in their lives. So I've got a slide of a little overview of, of their, um, their poor and polluted perspective of God. They don't believe that God is loving. Uh, they don't see how awesome and unlimited he is in his nature. They're not giving him his proper honor and respect. They don't view him as a great and mighty king. They're doubting his character and his goodness, and they're doubting if it's even worth serving him at all. And, and this perspective of God is shaping their practices in life. They're offering defiled sacrifices. They're wanting pardon in their life, but not really concerned about purification in their life at all. Um, They're rejecting God's instructions. They're making false promises and lying. They're marrying people who worship idols, which are leading their their faithfulness to to God, um, that's compromising their faithfulness to God. Uh, They're abandoning their spouses for no good reason, and they're being a poor stewardship of God's resources. So there's a lot of problems that Malachi is addressing, and it's especially sad when you think that God has sent the people into exile and they've returned to their land, and yet their hearts are still far from God. And so I just want to give you uh, five personal applications from the book of Malachi that, um, that we can draw out as we look at what God speaks through his messenger, Malachi, and we see their relevance for our own lives. Um, And the first is that Malachi teaches us that our perspective of God is inseparably linked to our practices in life. How you view God will shape how you live life. That, That goes for whether you believe he exists or doesn't exist, or whether you believe he deserves the utmost honor and respect in your life, or whether he's just an afterthought. A very respected pastor and spiritual author of the 20th century named A.W. Tozer, he started one of his spiritual classic books called Knowledge of the Holy, saying, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most telling fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. We are creatures who are hardwired for a relationship with God. And how we view God and perceive God matters greatly. And we will tend to move toward our mental picture of who God is. There's another author named 
uh, James Brian Smith. I've been going through his series on spiritual formation, and he starts out his series and continues all the way through with the importance of the narratives that we have in our mind. And, and he says, we are shaped by our stories. In fact, our stories, once in place, determine much of our behavior without regard for their accuracy or helpfulness. Once these stories are stored in our minds, they stay there largely unchallenged until we die. And here is the main point. Narratives are running and often ruining our lives. That is why it is crucial to get the right narratives. The choices that we make, the way that we respond, it is often on the basis of some story or narrative that we have running through our mind. And that's why it's crucial to have accurate narratives and stories in our minds, especially the stories that we tell ourselves about God. The narratives that we have about who God is are going to shape how we trust him and how we live our daily lives. If we believe that God loves us and he truly cares about us, we're going to be more inclined to run to him and trust him in every area of our lives. If we believe that he is wise and good and knows everything about us and everything there is about living life, then we're going to be more inclined to run to him in prayer and call out to him and seek his wisdom and his guidance. If we believe in our heart of hearts that he is good, that he's perfect, that he's righteous in all of his ways, then when we encounter a situation that we don't understand and we're asking, why is this happening? We're going to be more apt to trust God in those seasons that are, that are difficult to trust him because we know that he is good and he's righteous, and he's trustworthy. How we view God is going to shape how we live our lives. And that's what Malachi is confronting in the lives of these Israelites. They have a polluted perspective of who God is, and it's leading to profane practices in their lives. I remember in my own life, pretty clearly, before I started walking with Christ, I had a very polluted perspective of God. I wasn't even quite sure that God existed, but if he did exist, I wasn't sure that he was loving or that he was powerful. I looked around at the world and all of the, the evil in it and the brokenness, and I, I thought he's either you know, absent and he doesn't care or he's not all, all powerful and he can't do anything about it. And so I just w didn't give God honor and respect in my life. And I had a lot of narratives in my mind about who God was and what he was like, but there were a lot of false narratives. And when I turned to trust Christ in my life, it was as if God removed this cloud of pollution over my mind and over my eyes, and I, and I kept saying, I, I feel like I'm seeing God and seeing this world with new eyes. I just kept saying that over and over again because I couldn't believe how I had seen things before and how God was allowing me to see him now. And it was very humbling and I, as I looked back at my life and the way that I had been living, I saw that at the root of it was a total misrepresentation of God, and my perspective of God had been way off. And trusting in Christ can remove the blinders. I believe that's why God uses a lot of examples in Scripture of people being uh, healed from blindness. And like in the Apostle Paul's life, the scales fell off. All of a sudden, they're seeing God and seeing reality clearly for the first time. And God knows the truth. Um, he is the truth. And he knows that often we are deceived in this world. And so God is confronting the people of Malachi with a series of corrective questions, not because he needs answers, but because they need to examine themselves in light of the truth. And we'll have that, we'll, we need that same experience in our lives. We need to stop and pause and examine ourselves honestly in light of who God reveals himself to be. To say, am I being humble about this? Am I being honest about this? God, would you show me who you really are and help me to see who you are? And I believe that's a prayer that God will answer. And he'll meet you where you are, and he knows how to sift through your questions, your doubts, the hang-ups that you have, and help you to see him clearly. And so the first application I would give you from Malachi is that our perspective of God will shape our practices in life. And so it is very important that we cry out to God and ask him to shape our perspective of who he is. 
A sep- second application that I give you from Malachi is that God will confront and correct us, but it will always be done in love. I mean, it might make us feel scared to think that God would confront and correct us, but know that from the very beginning of Malachi, as God sets out on this uh, dialogue with his people to confront and correct them, the first thing that God says is, I have always loved you. Isn't that kind of comforting to know that God loves us like that? He has always loved us, and if he's going to come and correct and confront something in our lives, it's going to be on the basis of love. It's going to be to bring healing, not to bring our harm. Now, I, I want to take a little uh, sidetrack here and, and point out in Malachi, it, it says, God says that I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Now, that's, that's a passage that has been troubling to some. How could God love Jacob but hate Esau? And especially when we have other parts of the Bible, like John 3.16, that says that God loves the whole world. Well, in Scripture, it's, it's important to remember that um, Esau, from Esau came an entire nation called the Edomites. And from Jacob came another nation called the Israelites. And Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And so Jacob was the namesake of the Israelite people. And, and Esau became the namesake of the Edomites. And in a larger sense, they became representations of, of the people of God and those who are following God and the people who were not following God because Esau is depicted as a person who despised his birthright. He despised um, that which represented the eternal things of God and a relationship with God and following him just for temporary pleasures. So he traded the, the eternal for temporary. And so God used these two names as, as um, type of figureheads to represent the people of God and the way of walking with him and the way of not walking with him. And so I, I would say it this way, that, that God loves all people, but he doesn't necessarily love all paths. He doesn't love all choices that we can make. He doesn't love the idea of not walking in life with him. He calls us to trust him and to walk with him and to be close to him. And because God loves us so much and he knows that's what's best for us, he hates all of those paths that lead away from him. (laughs) Sorry, sound effects. And so God says, I, I, I love Jacob. I, I, love, I love my people. I love that place of trusting me. But, but I hate that path that leads away from me. And so as we think about our own lives, God might say, I, I have some things I need to confront you on. I have some things I need to correct in your life. And instead of becoming defensive, we should we should be humble and say, Lord, I, I welcome that because I know you love me even more than I love myself. You've always loved me, even when I can't see it. Remember, we have false narratives about God, and sometimes we go through, see, I can't see your love, God, but he loves us more than we love ourselves. And when God says, I need to confront and correct you on something in your life, to develop the posture that says, God, I welcome that, because I know if that's what you have to say in me, it's for my best, and I want to receive that. Malachi encourages us to receive the correction of God, knowing that it's always done in love, and it's always for our good. A third application that I'd give you from Malachi is that um, worship of the biblical God is not compartmentalized religion, it's a transformed life. It's a transformed life. In, in many places throughout history, uh, people have attempted to keep their religious life to one compartment of their lives rather than to include God in every area of their lives. That's a man-made invention. That's not the biblical picture of worship. A lot of times we might think, you know, I've, I've got my work area over here, I've got my school area over here, my finances over here, my friends over here, and then here's my religious area over here, and I've got that covered. 
And then the rest over here is kind of my, my business and, and doing things the way that, that I want to do them. But that's not the biblical picture of worship. It is living life with God in every area of our lives and being transformed by him. The people in Malachi's day seem to have this compartmentalized picture of God. They were very religious. They, they, would, go, they would go to temple. They, they would pray. They would offer some sacrifices, although it was the defiled lame ones. They would give a tithe. They would pray some prayers and go through uh, the routines that they had. And then they would go about their way and they would cheat their neighbor and they would lie to their spouse or divorce them in a cruel fashion and they would just do whatever they wanted in the rest of their life. And the Lord says, I'm not pleased with that. In fact, in Malachi 1.10, he said, how I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. And so the Lord is addressing this posture that they have in life of leading a sinful life and then just trying to include him into it and continue on with their religious practices. And God is saying, that's, that's not pleasing to me. We need to deal with that. And I think that shows a lot of character and integrity on God's part. He's not upset about them not giving the choice meat because he likes prime rib or he likes filet mignon or he's saying, hey, you're, you're shortchanging me and give me the leftovers of that sacrifice there. He doesn't need the meat. He knows that when we give him the leftovers in our offerings, we're giving him the leftovers of our lives. It's a reflection of what's going on in our hearts and how we are in relationship to God. And God is confronting that and saying, we have some things that we need to talk about because your heart's are far from me right now. And I'm calling you to trust me and to love me as I deserve. So as we think about our lives and we think about every area of our lives, Malachi would instruct us that God does not want a compartmentalized religion. He doesn't want us to quarantine him from every area of our lives and then think that that pleases him. He wants to be involved in every area of our lives and to transform our lives completely. That's the biblical view of worship. A fourth application from Malachi is that Malachi teaches us that the privilege of a right relationship with God comes with the responsibility of representing him well. Malachi 1 says, My name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty, but you profane it. God has given the Israelites this privilege to, to know him, to know his instructions, to see him for who he is. And as they trust him, as they live out his commands, as they walk with him, they're supposed to be a light to the surrounding nations and reflect what God is like. And, and that light is supposed to shine in the darkness and draw people to faith in God. And instead, their practices are, an, are a complete misrepresentation of God and his character. And God says, you're profaning my name. You're bearing my name, but you're being a misrepresentative of who I really am to the world. Now, I, I remember I grew up with this uh, DC Talk album. Uh, anyone else listen to DC Talk or hear of them? Okay, two of us. Uh, but they were pretty cool back in the day. Um, and at the beginning of one of their albums, they, they had a quote from Brennan Manning, um, who, who says, uh, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So as Christians, we have privilege upon privilege, blessing upon blessing, but with that blessing of knowing God and spending eternity with him and being his own child comes with the responsibility of reflecting him and representing him well to the surrounding world. That's the mission and call that God has given to us as his followers. And sadly, even the priests in Malachi's day were leading the people astray. God specifically calls out the priests in Malachi and says, the, the priests have left his path. 
they were giving their own instructions instead of God's instructions. They were leading people into sin, and they were showing favoritism and partiality. And, and God says, I remember a time when I had priests that instructed people according to the word of God. They showed reverence and obedience, and they honored me and my instructions. They passed on the truth that I gave so that people could walk in accordance with the instruction that I've given. And God says they didn't lie or cheat or steal. They didn't compromise with the surrounding culture and allow the people to worship idols in addition to the true God. They walked with God and lived good and righteous lives. And so God is giving a call to the religious leadership of Malachi's day to repent because they too are part of the problem in leading the people astray. And God is calling them to repentance in love and calling them to live lives that reflect who he is. They're bearing his name and he's calling them to bear it well. So Malachi reminds each of us that we have the privilege of having a right relationship with God, but we also have the responsibility of bearing his name well in this world. And a final application I want to point out from Malachi before giving the, the reminder that he closes with is that God has come with purification and he will come again with purification. Now, it's somewhat ironic in the book of Malachi, and we've all done this in our own lives as well, that the people, the Israelites in Malachi's day, they're blaming God of being unjust. They're, blame, they're, they're questioning God's righteousness. And in the meantime, they're committing all sorts of unholy and unrighteous practices themselves. And God tells the Israelites in that day, he says, I, I am coming and I am coming with purification, but who is going to be able to stand in that day? In other words, you, you're calling out for justice, but are, are you yourselves walking in justice? Would you yourselves be able to stand if I came and truly administered and executed justice? So Malachi gives a prophecy about the coming of John the Baptist and the coming of Jesus Christ. And he says, I am coming to purify. And we know from New Testament revelation that John the Baptist came and, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus came and he laid down his life for the sin of the world. And we who trust in Jesus experience God's purification in our life. And we who refuse to trust in Jesus stand on our own merits in front of God. And so we, we would kind of hear God's word if we haven't trusted in, in Jesus to say to us, you're accusing me of being unjust. I'm going to come in justice, but who is going to be able to stand in that day when I come in justice? Because we have been told in his word that not only has he come to give his purification in the coming of Jesus Christ, but he's coming again. And who is going to be able to stand in that day when he comes and he executes justice? And so it's ironic that a sinful, unrighteous, unholy people could accuse a holy, blameless, perfect, righteous God of being unrighteous, of being unjust. And God says, I'm coming to call out sorcery, the cheating of employees' wages, the oppression of widows and orphans, the depriving people of justice and unrighteousness of all kinds, the very things that the people in Malachi's day were practicing. God says, I'm coming to call that out. I'm going to come and deal with it. But who's going to be able to stand in that day? There was once a, a, a woman who came to a famous preacher named Charles Spurgeon. And uh, she said, I, I'm disturbed by the passage that says that God hated Esau. How could God hate Esau? And Charles Spurgeon said, that's not what disturbs me. I'm disturbed that it says God could love Jacob. Really, when you think about it, the uh, troubling part is not how could God, how could a holy God administer justice to an unholy and unrighteous people? It's how could God love any one of us? And yet he does. And he died for us while we were yet sinners. 
And we had no regard for his righteousness and his holiness. And God declares in Malachi 3, 6, he says, I am the Lord God and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. In other words, it's because of who I am, not because of who you have been, that you're not already destroyed. We're saved on the basis of grace and on the basis of God's love and on the basis of his undeserved mercy in our lives. And so we cry out for justice at times when what we really need is to cry out for God's mercy that he's shown us in Jesus. He's given us both justice and mercy in Christ. Well, I just want to close with this final reminder that Malachi gives us. It's a fitting reminder, and and here it is. It's when God seems silent, trust in God's word. This is the last book of the Old Testament, and it ushers in what is commonly called the 400 years of silence. And a lot happened during that time period between the Old Testament and New Testament. God wasn't distant or uninvolved in in the world, but it's called that because it, it signifies the close of the Old Testament scriptures and the start of the New Testament scriptures. And so it's been called this 400 years of silence. And as, as they enter that time period, toward the very end of the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, God says in Malachi 4.4, 4, Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, and all the decrees and regulations that I have given him on Mount Sinai. There's going to be times in life when it seems like God is silent and he's distant. And in those seasons, we especially need to remember what God has already spoken. God's given us a a treasure chest of his voice in in his word. And in those seasons of life where we're saying, God, I can't see you, I can't hear you, I'm having trouble to perceive you, God would instruct us, remember to obey my words and the instructions that I've spoken. When God seems silent, trust in his word and remember what he has already spoken. Well, it's been a a privilege to go through the Old Testament. God has given us a lot to chew on. He's given us a lot. He's spoken a lot through his word. And he invites us to continue to seek his who he is and and to seek what he says in his word and to put it into practice. And I'm looking forward to going into the New Testament now and seeing what God continues to speak and reveal to us. As we um, close today, let's go to him in prayer and just ask him to do a good work in us.